Hello everybody, and welcome to Ancient Architects. Please subscribe now to get the latest ancient history news and independent research from around the world. Whilst many have survived into the 21st century, there is real physical evidence for a number of lost pyramids of Egypt, and for those that haven't left an obvious imprint in the sand, there are numerous historical accounts. Danish naval captain Frederick Norden attested to a fourth pyramid on the Giza Plateau, whilst Herodotus documented two others, both of which, according to him, were comparable in size to the Great Pyramid. As many of you know, Herodotus was a Greek historian, who lived during the 5th century BC. A contemporary of the great Socrates, he is often referred to as the father of history, a title conferred by Cicero. He was the first historian known to have broken from Homeric tradition to treat historical subjects as a method of investigation, by collecting his materials systematically and critically and then arranging them into a historiographic narrative. Being an historian, it is no surprise that he took great interest in Egypt, and when trawling through his writings, he offers the only description of two now lost pyramids that may have had a huge importance to the ancient Egyptian way of life. The pyramids I am referring to once stood side by side in the centre of Lake Meris, and astonishingly, they were both reportedly as tall as the Great Pyramid of Giza. On visiting the lake, Herodotus described what he saw. The measure of the circuit of Lake Meris is 3,600 furlongs. This is the same number of furlongs as the extent of Egypt itself along the sea. The lake lies extended lengthwise from north to south, and in depth, where it is deepest, it is 50 fathoms. That this lake is artificial and formed by digging is self-evident, for about in the middle of the lake stand two pyramids, each rising above the water to a height of 50 fathoms, the part which is built below the water being of just the same height, and upon each is placed a colossal statue of stone sitting upon a chair. Thus the pyramids are 100 fathoms high, and these 100 fathoms are equal to a furlong of 600 feet, the fathom being measured as 6 feet or 4 cubits the feet being four palms each and the cubit six. The water in the lake does not come from the place where it is, for the country there is very deficient in water, but it has been brought thither from the Nile by a canal, and for six months the water flows into the lake, and for six months out into the Nile again, and whenever it flows out, then for the six months it brings into the treasury a talent of silver a day from the fish which are caught, and twenty pounds when the water comes in. The natives of the place, moreover, said that this lake had an outlet underground to the Sirtis which is in Libya, turning towards the interior of the continent, upon the western side, and running along the mountain which is above Memphis. This passage is taken from Histories 2, and the part on Ancient Egypt is available to view in its entirety by clicking the link in the description below. As stated, this is the only account of the two now lost pyramids of Lake Meris. Herodotus states that the lake itself is 50 fathoms deep, which is approximately 300 feet. The pyramids, he records, that were central in the lake were 100 furlongs or 600 feet high, with half of them submerged under the water. If you have been following my channel, you will have noted my belief that the function of the pyramids is strongly associated with water, and these examples seem to totally back up my claims. Herodotus categorically states that the lake was man-made, an overflow for the river Nile, which was filled with water for six months of the year when the Nile flooded. Therefore, if the lake was man-made, it means that the pyramids, half of which were submerged, were built onto the artificial lake bottom. If you were building a lake, why would you place two pyramids inside it so that half of each structure would knowingly become submerged for half of the year, and maybe longer if the lake was dammed? What we learn from Herodotus is that the lake was built first and then the pyramids were built onto the artificial lake bottom, meaning it is likely to be all part of one large construction project. But do we know when the lake was built? Well, scientists and historians believe that Fayum Hollow, which housed the lake, was a natural feature, and the Nile flooded into it for thousands of years. The water level of the lake is well understood by scientists. In prehistoric times, the waters of Lake Meris stood nearly 120 feet above sea level, but by 10,000 BC it dropped by nearly 25 feet below sea level, possibly as a result of the Nile being naturally diverted. With an increase in rainfall between 9,000 and 4,000 BC, the lake rose again, but gradually subsided. It was first recorded in history in around 3,000 BC, 
around the time of the first dynastic pharaoh, Narma or Menes. Apparently, the lake was bordered by Neolithic settlements, and the town of Shedet grew up to the south, where the higher ground created a ridge. In pre- and old dynastic times, it is believed that the lake would only fill when floodwaters were particularly high. It is also believed that Menes modified this lake to incorporate it into his large-scale agricultural projects, such as irrigation, which he introduced into Egypt. It was around 1800 BC, in the 12th dynasty, when Amenemhat III widened and deepened the waterway from the Nile to the lake, to make a canal now known as the Baha Yusuf. The man-made waterway had three purposes, to control the flooding of the Nile, to regulate the water level of the Nile during dry seasons, and to also irrigate the surrounding area. The 12th dynasty pharaoh is believed to have dug out much of the lake, which was like a swamp when he began the project and turned it into a reservoir to store surpluses of water for use during the dry period. Mainstream scholars say that this work by Amenemhat gave Herodotus the impression that the entire lake was artificial. Both Herodotus and Diodorus Siculus, who lived in the 1st century BC, believe a man named Meris was responsible for its construction, but many believe Meris was simply another name for Amenemhat III. Others say that Meris was actually Menes, the pharaoh that unified Upper and Lower Egypt and who was well known for irrigating the land with clever water management processes and who certainly worked on Lake Meris. Some believe that Meris was an even more ancient pre-dynastic king and then there are researchers that believe Meris wasn't a person at all, but it is a term that simply translates to Great Canal or Great Lake. Whatever the truth, whether natural or man-made, the lake was of extreme importance to the Egyptians, also being known as Pure Lake and Osiris Lake. Some modern researchers question if the area of the Fayum Hollow is the correct location for the lake, as the area described by Herodotus is too big. But Sir Hanbury Brown said that the ancient shoreline can be traced and that in antiquity it would have covered the entire modern-day Fayum province. Researcher Stein Vandenhoven believes that Meris, whoever he was, dug out the lake in its entirety and occupied an island in the centre of the lake as a kind of seat of government and power. He believes that Amenemhat III came later, worked on the lake for water management purposes, reduced its size so that some of the area could be used for agriculture, whilst the island's centre was reclaimed and reoccupied by the new pharaoh. The pyramids of the lake, he believes, did exist. But was it Meres, Menes or Amenemhat that built them, and what was their function? If the description by Herodotus is correct, the fact that two of Egypt's largest pyramids were built inside Egypt's largest lake should be telling us something about their purpose. For a start, they could not have been tombs. They were flooded in the time of Herodotus, so it would have been a flood risk in more ancient times when the lake was possibly even deeper. Apart from the Great Pyramid, the so-called burial chambers for just about every other pyramid were reached by descending into the structure, which means that if the burial chamber in the Lake Meris pyramids followed this general trend, they may well have been flooded for six months of every year, which is certainly peculiar if, as we are told, a pyramid is built as a tomb. Even if the internal layout matched that of the Great Pyramid, with an ascending passageway to the so-called burial chamber known as the King's Chamber, it too would have been submerged, according to the description written by Herodotus. Also, why would any pharaoh need two tombs? Why build two tombs side by side? Amenemhat was already responsible for the Black Pyramid at Dashur, a failed project, and also one at Hawara, which is believed by Egyptologists to be his final resting place. So if pyramids are tombs, then we can safely assume that this pharaoh did not build those in Lake Meris. Apparently, Amenemhat spent 15 years on the Black Pyramid before the project was deemed a failure. He then went on to build the Pyramid at Hawara and its associated labyrinth. And although the labyrinth was spectacular, the pyramid certainly wasn't, when compared to the other examples such as those at Giza. It was built with a mud brick core and a casing of white limestone, and its internal corridors have not survived the test of time like earlier Egyptian pyramids. If pyramids did exist inside the lake, then they must have been there for hundreds, if not thousands of years before Amenemhat, because his pyramid building method of using mud brick meant that they could never have lasted inside the lake with a fluctuating water level up to the time of Herodotus they would have almost certainly become destabilised in more than a thousand years. 
I don't doubt that Amenemhat widened and deepened the canal into the lake, but I do think he inherited it. And the pyramids recorded by Herodotus? Well, as Amenemhat was clearly such a bad pyramid builder, they were either there before him, or the unsubstantiated claims by Herodotus of large pyramids are either wrong or grossly exaggerated. Let's assume they did exist, as many believe. As Amenemhat dedicated much of his life's work on the enormous civil engineering projects on the ancient lake, maybe he tried to copy the pyramids that he found in the centre. I wouldn't be surprised if the internal layout of the Hawara pyramid matched that of one of the Marius pyramids, but of course, we'll never know. I've stated in previous videos how I think the Great Pyramid, at least in part, acted as a water pump, and if you look at the internal layout of the Hawara pyramid, it does look somewhat industrial, with pipe-like corridors. The central burial chamber also has features that look like four pistons. For the Hawara Pyramid, they were used in conjunction with sand, to apparently close the burial chamber. But if this feature was copied from the waterlogged pyramids of Lake Meris, it could certainly have been some kind of pump mechanism. The existence of two pyramids in the centre of Lake Meris, with access to huge volumes of water in a possible man-made reservoir, makes their function as ancient water pumps not totally unbelievable in my opinion. Herodotus may have alluded to this when he said, the natives of this place, moreover, said that this lake had an outlet underground to the Sirtis which is in Libya, turning towards the interior of the continent. Here, he tells us that local legends say there is an underground outlet from the lake to Sirtis, the modern-day Gulf of Sidra in Libya, a distance of some 1,000 kilometres, which does sound somewhat unbelievable, and I think such a claim is false or at least an exaggeration but the fact that legends about underground outlets exist at all may be quite telling. And unless such outlets rely totally on gravity to function, you would expect the addition of a pump if Lake Meris was part of a large ancient irrigation system. As mentioned in one of my previous videos, many believe that Lake Meris fed the Giza Plateau with water in antiquity. Outside of the Great Pyramid, but inside its perimeter wall, there was a well shaft that filled the area between the pyramid and the wall with water. This water could not have come from the Nile, as the river is lower than the Giza Plateau, but Lake Meris is higher than Giza, and many researchers strongly believe the lake is Giza's water source. But to reach there, at a distance of 80 kilometers, surely a pump would be needed. There is no more real analysis I can do on this theory, because apparently the so-called Lake Meris pyramids have vanished without a trace. Egypt's Ptolemaic kings of the 3rd century BC partially drained Lake Meris to make available 450 square miles of rich alluvial soil, which was irrigated by canals and used for extensive cultivation. It was probably then when the pyramids of the lake were dismantled, if of course they existed at all. Using just one source for an historical argument isn't a good way to build a hypothesis. So without archaeological evidence, we have to look at the possibility that Herodotus was either making false claims, got it wrong, or that he greatly exaggerated the size of the structures that he saw. But what if there is archaeological evidence? What if researchers have been overlooking a site for hundreds of years simply because it didn't exactly match the description put forward by Herodotus? I believe Herodotus did see two pyramids, and I believe I know exactly where we can find them. It is thanks to a paper written by Stein van den Hoven called Herodotus Lost Pyramids in the Tomb of King Meris, which I have used for the rest of this video, as well as including a few of my own ideas, because I certainly agree that he has discovered the location of the Lost Pyramids of Lake Meris. The paper is linked in the description below, and I would urge you to download it and to follow Stein on social media. I've included the relevant links below. In the heart of the Fayum Oasis, in the middle of the ancient Lake Meris, are the remains of ancient structures known as the Pedestals of Biamu. As we have seen, Herodotus described two large pyramids with seated statues on top. The Pedestals of Biamu are two structures made from blocks of stone which could be interpreted as ruined pyramids. They are found in the region known as Kors Farun, which means the Chair of the Pharaoh. They are also referred to as El Ali, meaning the high places, and the stone structures are believed to be the bases of two colossal statues of none other than Amenemhat III. Dominican father Johann Michael Vansleb reported seeing the bottom of these statues in the 1600s, whilst Lepsius and Petri certainly found around 50 fragments. The nose of one of the statues is displayed in a museum in Oxford, England. 
Petrie estimated that the pyramids, or pedestals as they are now known, were only 18 metres or 60 feet in height, although he is guessing, and he also recorded that they were washed by the waters of the lake. Apart from their height, they perfectly fit the description of the pyramids seen by Herodotus, and logic suggests that Herodotus was right with his observation, but mistaken for their height. The pedestals of Biamu are situated centrally in the ancient Lake Meris, and their square bases can be seen quite clearly on Google Earth. Linant Belafonts, who lived during the 19th century, visited the site and was sure these structures are what Herodotus saw. He believes that because Herodotus viewed them from quite some distance, from a boat on the lake, they looked like they were rising out of the deep water, and not built on an island, which would have been hard to see from a distance if the water level was particularly high and the island relatively flat. Flinders Petrie noted that the two statues on the tops of the pyramids were looking in the same direction, and were 66 metres or 200 feet apart. He noted that each pedestal or pyramid was covered in completely smooth stone, and due to how he found them, he was convinced that treasure hunters had searched them extensively and also quite destructively, and that much of the original stone had been used for more recent building projects. In the Encyclopedia of Architecture in Ancient Egypt by Dieter Arnold, you can find some fabulous old drawings. But looking at their Google Earth footprint, as well as the remaining structures on the ground, the original pyramids were far larger than these drawings show, approximately half the size of the Giza Pyramid of Menkore. From this, and if they are true pyramids, we can speculate that they were around 100 feet or 30 meters in height. And this old picture by Lepsius certainly implies that, in antiquity, the pedestals of Biamu were in fact pyramids. Interestingly, on inspecting the ancient site, Flinders Petrie found evidence in the construction techniques of the pedestals that there was indisputable evidence that they predated the reign of Amenemhat III. As well as these ancient building techniques, he also found evidence of ancient high quality stonework, such as sandstone monoliths polished to shine like glass, and there is an abundance of finely worked red granite, like what we see at many other truly ancient Egyptian sites. There is stonework that bears the name Amenemhat III, but interestingly, as Petri notes, the specific inscription with his name refers to his work of restoration, proving that these two pedestals or ancient pyramids do in fact predate the 12th dynasty pharaoh. The two seated figures on top of the pyramids were probably depictions of Amenemhat III, the restorer, and that is why they were so unusual, because they were not original features. If Amenemhat restored them, as the inscription states, then he would have had knowledge of their internal chambers, and his own pyramid at Hawara could therefore have certainly copied these more historic examples, which could have been ancient water pumps inside Lake Meris, to distribute water around Egypt through the dry season. It is worth adding that the soil around these ancient pyramids contains magnificent slabs of limestone pavements, and there are even stairs that descend down into the earth. This is an ancient pyramid complex, but for Egypt it is certainly unique. Not only is it a pyramid complex surrounded by greenery, it is also in the centre of an ancient lake, and if ever there was a site deserving of archaeological excavation, this is one that would surely bring up some spectacular finds. I'm aware that this has been quite a complicated video, but to recap, the pedestals of Biamu are the two pyramids as noted by Herodotus. They were built on an island in the middle of the ancient Lake Meris, possibly by the pharaoh who unified Egypt known as Menes, or possibly someone even earlier. They would have been around 100 feet high, and it is my belief that they were some kind of ancient water pump system, much like the Great Pyramid. The system and the lake then went out of use and became a swamp. But Amenemhat III dug out the swamp to create a reservoir, and widened the channel to the Nile. He then renovated the pyramids, and added two large statues of himself on their summits. There is evidence that he also added docks to the island, and it was possibly a site of great importance, a symbol of power, during his reign. The pyramids were possibly ruined when the Ptolemaic kings of the 3rd century BC partially drained the ancient lake, and future invading people continued the destruction and reused their stone for new building projects. Herodotus was right all along. The pyramids of Lake Meris certainly existed. Maybe their secrets may still be lying there in the middle of this ancient oasis, just waiting to be discovered. Thank you for watching this episode of Ancient Architects. If you enjoyed the video, please subscribe to the channel, 
please like this video and please leave a comment below. Thank you very much.